You're listening to the Poster Boy Podcast. Our mission is to help young entrepreneurs in small town America start, grow, and manage 21st century businesses. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hey, this is Chad. Hey, and this is Drew. Today, we're going to have a podcast. But today's podcast is actually going to be an interview. Chad, who are we introducing today? Uh, So we're interviewing a friend of mine and and a tournament director that we work with. His name is Darren Larson out of Houston, Texas. Nice to meet you, Darren. Darren, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I've been doing tournaments for roughly 15 years. Uh, Started with USSA about 10 years ago. Before that, I was in the insurance business for 20 years doing health, disability type of marketing, door to door, business to business. Well, it sounds like Darren, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, Darren, I think something cool that's interesting is you helped Aflac start the state of Alaska. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, it was back in the night. It was way back in the 90s. I'm old. Uh, <laughs> it was. I, I, I kind of stumbled into it. I used to sell door to door for a marketing company in Washington state and in in Colorado, we got to Alaska and that was door to door in the country. And then when I got to Alaska, I met, met a couple that were, they were the district managers for, or the state director basically for, for Alaska. And I went to work with them at the same time they came in. And so we went, we basically, in the middle of winter, I cold called pretty much every business in the city of An- in the city of Anchorage, um, every alleyway, car dealerships, everything. <laughs> it was uh, a lot. It was a lot of fun in the snow and the ice. But did it actually work out pretty well? Oh yeah, no, I, I won every award Aflac ever had. I, I was way ahead of pace on everything. I set record paces on all that stuff. Um, I was with them um, probably. A year, maybe a little over a year, and then the state. Of course, the state manager guy, just like happens a lot of times, they once we started hiring people, he started getting a little greedy on some things, and so I, uh, I wanted to, I went to another company to help them. Okay, I mean it makes sense. Well, okay, so now the real question is, you know, obviously me being in sports, and that's how we met. How did you actually get into sports and into tournaments specifically? Uh, ba- basically, I used to have an insurance trust for health insurance in Hawaii, of all places, and I was over there for about six years, and being the Halley guy from the mainland, living on the mainland after the first three years, uh, I uh, got kind of hit over the head by that political machine uh, when, you're, <laughs> when, you're not the big, when you're not the big guy in the room, and so kinda, it kind of stung me a little bit. I, I sold everything I had to do with Hawaii after that and put me into basically put me into bankruptcy and I uh I just I took my last ten thousand dollars and asked a buddy of mine hey you got ten grand and we asked another guy you got ten grand and we opened uh an indoor batting cage place that had a pizza place in the front of it and so the pizza was going to carry the note on the business and we would do baseball in the back and all of that. And that just kind of, at the time we took over, my business partner at the time decided he was going to go get three fields while we were opening this other brand new business that was an hour away. And I didn't want to do it, but I got us the contract on the park and it basically killed us for the first year. And then we, uh, Big League Dreams, which is a big franchise of baseball fields around the country. There's like 10, 15 parks on the West Coast and in Texas. Yep. Um, they're, all, they're all replica parks, $20 million, $30 million to build them. Um, I was able to convince them that I was a tournament promoter because I, I ran this park down the street. <laughs> and so I, uh, so I got in there for like five, six tournaments a year. I did that for probably five years. And then at just at Big those, League Dreams? Yeah, I was just running at Big League Dreams. We used to do some fundraising tournaments before that but it was just kind of for our teams. And so once I convinced them I was a director, I kind of started, I was in my wheelhouse personality wise. So I, uh, basically I do really, I did really well on those tournaments, my five or six weekends that I had there. And then at the time the UCCA state director decided he was going to go start his own company and he took all the directors and all the parks with them. And at the time UCCA had 98% 
market share in Houston. I was the only non UCCSA guy in Houston. And he went and started another company, took everybody with him except a couple guys. And that's when I called UCCSA and said, hey, I'll help you out and fix what you fix your pro, fix some of your problems you got right now. And so they brought me on board and we started out with doing. What, well, co- what company, company did they go and start? Was it Nations? Yeah, it was the Nations. You don't, you know, you don't advertise other people's companies, man. Come on. Okay, my bad. I, you know, I just wanted to know who it was. You know, <laughs> <laughs> free advertising. Man. Okay, Come okay, on. okay, got it. <laughs> but I guess you didn't read that book, right? Come on. No, I haven't. I, so, I think I, I need to find it though. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, uh, but anyway, so we, I was going probably there for the first year or two. We, we, we were doing pretty good, but like I was. I was, hey, we had a big, we'd have a big tournament this weekend, and two weeks from now we'd have a big tournament. So I would take the in between weekend off. Okay. And yeah. thinking, thinking, hey, we're not going to be big three weeks in a row. And, but all the teams that were playing with me were going playing with my competitor. And so we decided at that time, after a couple of years in there, kind of learning how to do it the right way, we, uh, we started to do them every weekend. We just put, put stuff out every weekend. And you had and no so, trouble, no trouble filling it from right out of the gate. Nah, we basically. I mean, we had to work. The first year I was with the AAA, we did. I did four hundred entries. Okay. Uh, the second year I did eight hundred, and then we went to then we went to twelve hundred entries, then we went to eighteen hundred entries, then to twenty four hundred. And and this year 30. you're looking at like eight thousand. Yeah, and this year last last year I was at our year is August to August. I was at 7,300 teams this last year. Na- the Nations or the other team, the other organization probably did roughly 3,000 teams at the most, right in there. <laughs> yeah. Entries, and they've got five or six people, and it's just me and my staff in Houston. So um, we've got, we'll do, we did 7,300 teams, but in the fall this year, I was up 1,000 teams already. And so I anticipate Damn. this year having a big jump again. And so year before we were 6,500, 6,600. I was really kind of surprised we got to 7,300. Um, but this year I anticipate being close to 9,000 teams this year. Wow. So, okay. Uh, to, to put that into perspective, and I, I think before we get too, too far ahead of it, Darren, cause we have a lot of questions we want to ask you. Um, you know, why don't you tell the story of how you know me versus, versus how I think I know you, you know? I don't know Chad at all. Me and Chad are like, uh, I don't know. I don't, I, I've seen a picture of you one time. I know. Darren and I have been working together for like eight or 10 years and we've never I met. I love the internet. I didn't know that. I love so the internet. So it's kind of so, funny, Drew. I don't know if you're aware of that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, uh, Julie, Julie, Julie was the glue to our relationship. Yeah, absolutely. So she's gone down and worked with at Darren's events many times and, you know, Darren, we used to call him the Phantom. So something real interesting about Darren that I could tell you, and Drew, you you will not be aware of, is that even though Drew or um, Darren runs South Texas in Houston for USSA, Darren was living in the state of Washington the entire time he built this. And so it's amazing that some directors live in the area that their company is in. And Darren lived, you know, thousands of miles away. And his is the largest. He's the single largest director for baseball in USSA in the entire country. And so if that tells you just it's it's amazing what he's been able to accomplish in an area. And, you know, like he said, don't mention nations. But at the same time, it's really it's it's important to mention nations because you came into their backyard. And, you know, that's the, I think to me, that's always been the most impressive piece because it's, it's a lot easier to take an area that has no competition and, and build it. But when you go into an area that has another company's headquarters in your town and then you destroy them, I, that to me always says volume about what you've been able to do. No, I appreciate, I appreciate it. But no, we've, me and Chad, me and Chad have basically been on the phone for a long, long time. And then Julie's been to my house in Washington, been, been to my house in Texas. Yep. Um, and it's, we've had a great relationship. And then the last year, year or so, me and Chad have talked more and more every week. Yeah. And well, so and, and so, a lot in common. something, something interesting to note about Darren, and it's kind of funny how he ties into the poster world. Um, so when Darren and I first started working together down in Houston, he had a sister in the state of Washington that we thought we, we were looking to have a presence with our poster company in the state of Washington. I talked to Darren. He had a sister that thought she might be interested. 
And um, we were able to work together and, and get something going up there. You know, it, it ended up not ending well for us by, you know, just there's a whole lot of things that that happened there. But it was actually nothing with Darren, myself or his sister. It just didn't work out for us there. Uh, we are actually going to be back in that area starting this year. But yeah, Darren was the first person that that helped us. Uh, he, he was willing to let us try things. And, you know, whenever we work with people, it's important to have those directors that allow you to, to test the waters and see what can stick versus, you know, everything you do is not always perfect. So I have a question. Maybe it's maybe it's too soon to jump to the punchline. But to to take this back to a couple of minutes ago, your domination in uh, Alaska and then now dominating the Houston market. How, what was the transition like? What were the skills that you brought over from sales and leadership to running an organization in, in a completely different industry? It's, it's funny. It's just, I, I was in my, in my twenties, I was the guy that like all my sales companies that I worked for, they, they would always, I was always the best sales, one of the top sales guys, but I wasn't motivated by money. And so I basically could make any amount of money I needed to make. And then I would just not work for a while. <laughs> and so, and I, and it would drive, it would drive these head sales guys crazy. And, and it wasn't, we went to Alaska part of the, the time he was, I'd been married about a year, year and a half, maybe almost two at the time. And we were getting ready to think about having kids. And my wife's like, Hey, look, we're not having any kids until all these bills are paid off. And, all our, all our wedding bills and all the credit card bills and all of that. And when you're 27, 28 years old and you got fifteen, twenty thousand dollars <laughs> yeah. of debt, that's a big, nu- that's a big number. Yeah, I mean, it is. And so, especially back in the nineties, it didn't like, it isn't like today with these young guys. And so my wife's like, Hey, she's thinking, Hey, six months, a year from now, we're going to be having a kid. And so that was about the time we were moving to Alaska. And I was like, I found that I, I fit in with Aflac really good. It was a good, they sold a similar product. They just did it in the workplace where I did it in homes before. And so like, she's like, Hey, you pay off all the bills. We can have a kid. <laughs> well, shit. Two months later, I filled up, paid off all the bills. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, that was my motivation to go cold call in the middle of winter in every city, every, every, every at back alley in Anchorage and to get that ball rolling. And so, and I was just, a re- I still, my, the, my biggest skill to this day is being relentless. Yep. And I'm just, that's my number one skill is I'm relentless. I don't say, I don't give up. I don't take no for an answer. Are you going to have to really tell me no a bunch of times in order for me to take that <laughs> as a no? And I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep coming at you. And that's what I did when I was there with the ba- whole, the whole baby thing. And so, and then. I really, I was really kind of spoiled in Anchorage and I got, I built such a good block of business up there in the insurance business. But my wife, my wife had, she worked for the, for the government and she was getting transferred to Hawaii. And I thought, Hey, no big deal. I'm killing it here. I'll do the same thing in Hawaii. And I grew up, I grew up around all multicultural type things. And so I'm thinking I'll fit right in. I, all my friends were Hispanic, Chinese, Guamanian, <laughs> Hawaiian growing up. I'm going to fit right in in Hawaii. And so, but I got there and I didn't realize how good I had an anchorage. And I was kind of feeling sorry for myself a little bit. And I, I, uh, I had a really rough six, seven, eight months. And so when you got to Hawaii, you did. Yeah. When we got to Hawaii, maybe the first year was I was having a pity party the whole time. And, <laughs> And I just, I finally, I finally broke away from the office I was at. I was the only, I was the only non-Japanese guy out of, out of 40 in this office. Okay. And I just, I said, I was just feeling, feeling the pity party. And I, uh, I went and opened up, I, of all things, I went and opened up my own company. And in Hawaii, in Hawaii. And I, I got a job with this insurance <laughs> marketing company to be their state director. And I basically, I hired, it wasn't until I hired my life changing to where I started working full time was when I hired my first employee. Yeah. You've told me that. And when I, when I hired my first yeah, no employee, pressure. I realized, heck, she wants to get paid on Friday. <laughs> and so from that point on, I stopped, from that point on, I stopped celebrating Groundhog Day and <laughs> it's, it's all the rest of all the rest of that stuff. <laughs> and I, I had to get, a, I had to get after it. And I just, 
And then, and then we try, and then my wife going to have her second kid about the same time in there somewhere. And same thing, pay off all the bills and we're not having another kid. And I just, I, I kill, I killed it over there after I, after that first year. And I, uh, did you end up selling got, the business or did you end up uh, just no, walking away or how did it work? No, the state of Hawaii basically put me out of business. Okay. And so I had bad advice. I, one of the one of the keys for me on the insur- in, in life a life lesson that I learned in Hawaii is never go against your own instincts. Yeah. And okay. if, if you've got good instincts and you've been fairly successful with stuff, and I went against my instincts and I listened to my attorney. Okay. And I let the attorney kind of guide us through the political stuff of how we were set up as a business. Okay. And. Basically, he told the state of Hawaii they didn't have jurisdiction over me, and then he told the federal government they didn't have jurisdiction over me, which meant nobody had jurisdiction over my health insurance plan, and the state was never going to let that happen. And so, and neither of them had jurisdiction, but they had to fix the issue, right? And so, and I should have been under the under the federal government would have been a much easier deal thing to deal with. Yeah. And so the state the state reclassified my insurance trust association plan. Okay. Into an insur- into an insurance company. And so once they did that, I was bankrupt because I didn't have three million dollars in the bank and reserves. Oh and so shit. Okay. I didn't owe anybody I didn't owe anybody money. Yeah. But they just when they reclassified me, they changed all the rules that I was operating under. No, that makes sense. I mean, it's similar to banks today. They have to have so much liquidity based on the deposits and things like that. I mean, it's pretty pretty yeah. similar. Well, yeah. okay. So, you know, Darren, part of part of our growing audience are people that are just getting started. And so the one thing that I find so fascinating, especially with you in general, is that you not only did this in Alaska, you did this in Hawaii, then you were able to be successful at baseball tournaments in Texas. And for me, what what's the correlation of work ethic? Because the, look, the industries selling something is very similar, right? I mean, it doesn't really matter the product. You just have to figure out a plan and go after it and be relentless. I think we know that. But what is it like when you got into baseball? First of all, when you, when you first got in, did you know you could be successful or did you ever have self-doubt or just from day one, you were just like, I can do this? It was pretty much in my wheelhouse, and, and as far as it, it took all my skills on the phone and in person with sales and the rest of it, it took it all and put it into one thing. And then I've always been a problem solver. Yep. And so, and it then sounds I like took Jed. a personality test a while back, and my personality test indicates I'm really high risk. <laughs> I, I don't have any fear, and so I'm a, high, I'm a big idea. I'm a big idea guy that doesn't fear failure on this on stuff. Sure. And so I, I'm going to, I'm, that's why I'm always doubling down. Yeah. And then I, uh, luckily I have a wife that's ex- extremely the opposite. And so she's an accountant, but so she kind of bounces out a little bit. And so, <laughs> but it's, uh, no, I just, I basically, for me, it's like, I've been very fortunate that my wife, I mean, you have to, somebody was telling me this the other day, I was talking to a spouse, actually, a, this lady married to a, almost billionaire guy right and her her she comes from money and she she made a really good point of if your spouse is not supportive of you doesn't matter doesn't matter guy or girl if they're not supportive of you and they're putting pressure on you to come home to do things that you need and not do you take care of your business you're not going to be successful no matter what i mean it doesn't matter what your personality is or anything else you got to have a successful a su- supportive spouse at home that likes living in the house she's in or he's in yeah and that they're supportive of you. If they're nagging you and why you always come home and do all this other stuff, you're not going to be <laughs> successful no matter what, or you're going to, or you're going to marry the person 20 years younger than you and you're going to get divorced. And, <laughs> and so, and it's going to, and it's going to be pretty tough on you. <laughs> and so I've been really fortunate that my wife is crazy enough to be supportive of all my dumb ideas. And well, okay. So I have a question about the ideas because there's a lot of people that, that listen that have big ideas, but they're too scared to jump in. So for someone who's relentless, you know, they get to hear my mentality often, but for someone who's relentless and you're not fearful, what do you think it is that causes you to not have a fear of failure? I, it's <laughs> kind of like, it's a sports background. And like, I, part of my, I'm, I'm, we, I've, we've mentioned this before is I'm broken. I mean, I come from like half my, I mean, I'm broken in a, in a lot of ways. Sure. And I have a, I have a, 
severe fear of failure and I've got a fragile ego to a certain degree more yeah. than I, than, than I let on to. Sure. And, and I'm constantly just battling that and I don't want to be sec- I I may not be number one, but I'm always thriving to be number one. Yeah. And so, and as long as I'm working to that goal, I'm ha- I'm happy. And so it's, uh, you've got to just have faith in what you're doing. You can ask, if you ask 10 people, seven are going to tell you you're stupid yep. and don't do it. But that's because they're in a nine to five job and they need that security. And you got to think some stuff out and have the right idea and stuff. But I mean, I, I've been, I've had five, I've had five pizza places since I left the insurance business. Okay. And three of the five have been successful. Okay. And I have two, I currently have two. I shut one down in order to open up the one that was my big one that I couldn't afford. I had to take all the equipment and everything out of that store. Uh, my very first one was not successful. My why? One, Can you tell me why? Bad lo- bad location. Uh, it didn't matter about, it had a lot of traffic in front of it. But the community was a bedroom community. Yep. Nobody was stopping there. It was on the w- it was on the way to wherever they were going, and no one is doing, no one is buying pizza, no one is stopping on the way home to get pizza when they still have a thirty minute drive. And I mean, I had I had a great looking staff, and their boyfriends didn't even come in to visit with them on Friday night. <laughs> I mean. And so it was, and so I'm driving around, I'm driving around with the guy to sell me another store. And he's telling me all the reasons I shouldn't open it in this one spot. I'm like, dude, those are the same reasons I shouldn't open my first store. And I had a loop. They, they, they failed on some paperwork. So I was able to force them to give me all my money back. Okay. And so, and then I opened the second store, which was successful. And then my third and fourth store was successful. And then when I moved to Washington, my wife convinced me that I needed a job other than the tournament stuff. So I bought a pizza place. Well, okay. I have a question for you. So you said that when you started your first one, you had $10,000 left and you asked two other buddies to also invest $10,000 each. So you basically, go ahead. So what I did was, so I did was the first one I did on my own was a small store. The second one I did on my own was a small store. Okay, the what was the what was the total capital requirement to get one of these off the ground? How little could you do it for? I I did the first one for fifteen grand, probably. Okay, that included and lease equipment, everything, right? Everything, everything. They they leave the company leased me the equipment. They did all of that stuff. The second store, I probably the second store, I probably got that for about fifteen thousand too. And if not, yeah, probably 15,000 for the second store. Really? And then when we were doing the bigger, when we were doing the bigger store, the bigger store, I, we basically, that's when I brought the two other guys in and we ended up getting an investor to invest 220. This is a great story, but I, he invested $220,000 into us. So we were two, we had $250,000 in cash. So, so he gave cash. you 220 and each of you put in 10,000. Yeah, so we had two fit. We had two fifty. Okay. okay. So what I did was, we built with that two hundred fifty thousand dollars. We built. We bought one acre of land. I built a building that's eleven thousand square feet. Just a shell. Okay. Just the shell. Okay. And then we also, but I also built the twenty five hundred square feet out in the front as a restaurant. Okay. With an office. Okay. So that build out's pretty expensive for 2,500 square feet. Sure. And then we put an indoor soccer arena in the back with batting cages. And we fully enclosed the back with nets. Okay. okay. That's a six, $700,000 project. Okay. And I got a bill for 250,000. The whole thing. Inclu- the whole thing, including parking lot. And so, and- wow. So let me ask you why, why indoor soccer? Why did you choose that? Why not just, why not make a smaller pizza place? What was the thought process hey, behind we it? We were doing baseball training and this was going to be a multi-purpose thing. We wanted to do a bigger indoor soccer arena, but we could only afford the smaller one. Okay. And so, <laughs> and then one of the keys to what I did, and, and the funny thing is no one can build a building for $17 a square foot. Yeah, of course. I mean, <laughs> that, that was just the building was $17. I mean, I don't, even know, I don't even know how I did it. It took me a year to figure it out. <laughs> so like, my indoor soccer, my indoor soccer arena for six months, they were trying to charge me $40,000 for the same material that I bought for seven from the same company. Wow. And so I talked to them guys so much over a six month period and, they, and it was 40,000, 40,000, 40,000. And so 
I convinced them. I found a way for them in their mind to justify selling to me for 7,500 bucks. <laughs> and so, and they sold it to me for 7,500 bucks. So basically and they so, probably were just tired of talking to you. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it was just, dude, I, I, I picked their, their thing apart. Like if you do this and do this and you can do it for this. And I mean, I, I mean, it was just, I don't even know how I even did it. I mean, we just stumbled across some guys. I mean, I just, that's been my key in general. And then that building took me a third of the time to build than anybody else would have taken. My, I mean, I have a partner that's in remodeling business. I mean, yeah. I, he, did, he wasn't even involved. I mean, I did all, I did all the general contracting. And, and then we, the second store we, we did in the same town that's five minutes away. I did, I built that store in two months with, we had to have, it was, it should have been a six month project. I got it done two months over Christmas time. And it used to be a Seven Eleven. We turned it into a restaurant in two months. And and how much and did you have to put into this one? <laughs> zero. Wait, you put zero dollars into this? I I take I take it back. We I we my brother in law put fifty thousand in for the equipment. Okay. The build out the build out was free. I had they wanted me our company to go into the building. The 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 landlord gave me a hundred and thirty thousand dollars for the build out. I acted as a general contractor. Didn't charge him anything. Okay. So he he paid me to. He paid me to do it. And so, and the funny thing with that is I get done with that project. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, like we have a three year lease with you and you just gave me 130 grand. How are you getting that money back? Okay. So, so in general, um, anytime I've leased an office, the landlords will ask you if there's anything that you want built out, if you want any walls built out and they'll usually like for a, a certain threshold, they'll build it for you to make it how you want, because obviously their long term goal is to get you to stay. And so, you know, um, and, and generally, I don't know, Darren, you got a three year lease. Uh, most of the leases that we've had for the business were at least three years and they like to get 60 month leases, you know, if at all possible. But, you know, I think one side's always pushing for the least, you know, the That's least smart. length of time. And then the other side's pushing for the, uh, the other. And, you know, another great strategy you can do to save money on this that we did was we found that by paying the lease in full for a year in advance, we were able to get like a 40% discount on the collective total because we're giving them cash up front. And we, we've been able to get some really good deals because you find if something's been vacant for 12 months and this guy has been paying for it, you know, or, or girl, they've been paying for this lease or, or their mortgage on it and they'd like to get some of that money back. And a lot of these guys, they have other deals that are in the works they would like to make on. So if you give them, you know, ten or twenty thousand, that might be the money they need down to pick up another property. But just, just something like that. But you know, so Darren, when you're talking about getting them to build it out, I mean, that alone is first of all, it's pretty amazing that you came in with fifty thousand dollars in equipment, you get the landlord to build the lease out or to build the building or gives you the money to build it, and then boom, you have another asset generating revenue. And you still have that to this day? Yeah, that store's still open. <laughs> And it's only five minutes away from our other store. They just serve two different parts of town. And they basically, it's only 20, 2,400 square feet. And when I, when I asked the guy that, he's like, they they have like 1,100 properties around the Houston area. Okay. I mean, these are down to earth guys that have access to a lot of money. They have a lot of properties sure. in the greater Houston area. <laughs> yep. And, he's, and his response to me was like, look, I need to make 10% on my money. Okay. And his, the key to him is, he doesn't need to make 10% plus principal. Sure. He was only trying to make 10% on his money. And those are the guys you want to do business with. Yep. And so, so he, so he knew that, Hey, he's He's increasing the value of his building yep. and going to help him get another tenant in the building. So if he spent 800,000 on the building, he needs to make eight grand a month in total rents for all four or five spaces. And then they're happy. They're going to make their money on the appreciation of the building. Okay. Yep. And so that's a great guy to do business with. Where, whereas when I went to Washington, I made a couple mistakes. When I bought the guy out, I should I should not bought it. I should not have bought him out completely. He was a great operator, but he ran into problems on a balloon payment or two, and so he was profitable. What I should have done was bought fifty one percent, let him stay on as a partner to run the operation. I should I should have left his name as a business. That was the biggest mistake. Business. What the probably the second biggest mistake I've ever done business wise is I didn't. I broke all my business rules because I wanted to move back to Washington. And then I should not have changed the name from a, the franchise that it was to my own personal name, company name. Okay. I should have left it as the franchise. I could have got in there for free. 
and I should have let him in there as a partner. And I should have let him operate the business. I should have bailed him out on his balloon payment. But but instead, done. you just bought him and you got rid of him and you changed the name. Yeah, and I changed the name. He was there 10 years and had a loyal following. Yep. And so and now that I'm an I'm all-star pizza now instead of Godfathers. And then I had people tell me my food sucked and they'd never been in the right. store before. And <laughs> because because they hated me because they thought I stole the store away from the, the old owner. Ah, and so okay. I you always want to transition anytime you buy, in my opinion, anytime you want to, anytime you buy a new company, always let it operate under the current name for an extended period of time. Don't change the name. And not right away and at least, right? Not right away. <laughs> not, a right, not right away. And then if you can keep the old owner in there for an extended period of time, keep the old owner involved. Yeah. Yeah. If it's the right situation, if it's the right situation. Now we're talking small business. You're buying a car dealership or something. Sure. Sure. Different. Sure. 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 I mean, no. You're in small business, small business. Unless he's getting ready to die or retire.